So, <coughs> Imam John, I want to ask you, we know there are a lot of denominations in Christianity. We have uh, Episcopalians and Protestants and Catholics and a lot of uh, denominations. Are all of them unanimous in the way they look at Jesus as what do they look at? You know, or yeah. are there differences? So pretty much, um, and it goes back to the Nicene Council in the, the middle of the 4th century um, after Christ, uh, peace be upon him. Um, and so um, at that place, there was a big debate mm -hmm. that was called by the Byzantine Eastern Roman Christian community because they're hearing all these different narrations about Christ. Interestingly enough, mm -hmm. the fact of world history tells us that the people who were living closest to where Jesus was did not perceive him to be divine. Um, son of God and that very special and touched and created for a very special purpose and very close to God as a created being, that was the, the way they kind of looked at it. So this idea of Jesus being like God himself was very much the Roman understanding. Um, so at Nicaea, because of the political power, obviously, of the Byzantines, mm -hmm. many Christians might say, well, they researched the thing very well and they decided, oh, wow, actually God is a trinity and we never knew this. Because obviously that creed is, is foreign to the history of the Israelites, <clears throat> who Jesus came to uh, confirm or to fulfill the prophecy of the Messiah, which is in their religion. So basically it was enforced heavily after that, um, that the Trinitarian idea of, of Jesus being part of God in that he is fully God, mm -hmm. but equally to Father and Holy Spirit who are also fully God and that that is only one but three persons of one. So that whole thing became confusing. But till today, there are various Christian groups who do not uh, ascribe to Trinitarians. So you have the Jehovah's Witnesses, the Mormons, uh, the Unitarian Christians, and, and that's general Unitarian Christians, not Unitarian Universalists, which is a whole different thing. Mm -hmm. um, but... Uh, so there are various Christian factions that do not uh, see the Trinity, uh, and so many of them that just see. And actually, I would say what I've found in meeting so many Christians that the majority of Christians I've met do not believe Jesus to be God Himself. Mm. Rather, they see Him as the Son of God, and so it's. I don't know if they're seeing it as a demigod, but if they really studied Jewish history, they would know that that is blasphemy. There's no such thing as that. So, um, but that's, they, they emphasize the difference and the mm -hmm. kind of subordinate nature, but yet closest, clearly separate from all other creation as Jesus, the Son of God. So those are the differences they have. Okay. So there are differences in the way the Christian de denominations. Historically, look at, look from at day one. Now, my question is, Christ, the, the idea of Trinity is something very difficult for Muslims to even comprehend. Okay, to Christians understand. will all admit this. So, so how do they explain to someone who is seeking truth? What is their explanation of the practicality of logic behind this trinity? Right. And why do you think that logic doesn't apply? I mean, that is not yeah. right. So, clearly what I feel and, and what I think all Muslims or Christians who do not buy into the Trinitarian theology is that the group in the Eastern Byzantium, uh, they already had the idea of God becoming person in the Greek mythology. Yes. So th that's very normal to them, whereas to the history of Jewish theology, this is blasphemy and yeah. idol worship. Um, so, and it negates the nature of God, which is above and beyond and mm -hmm. greater than and exalted above creation and objects and things like that. Mm -hmm. So um, the, the historical narrative is that it's a mystery. So the Catholic Catechism is the oldest. Um, they basically came out of that, you know, the Eastern Rome, the Roman Catholicism mm -hmm. of the Nicene Creed, and they adopted all of that. And, and so they've always had that, you know, idea. They'll admit it's a mystery. It's what we believe in faith. And so, uh, but they needed to reconcile 
I think, the finality of purpose of Jesus Christ. Because if he is just a prophet, then maybe there will be new prophets. Mm -hmm. So we need something that's crystal clear the end. You know, there can be no new religion. That way it solidifies that religion as the final testament and understanding. Whereas if you just keep him as a prophet like other prophets, then they will, there will be new yeah. um, prophets. And it seemed that they wanted to be separate from Judaism because Judaism has this idea of the Messiah and they basically, with this Trinitarian thing, completely invented a whole new idea of what is the Messiah and what is his purpose and identity and all of that mm -hmm. in this thing. So at that point, once they established this Trinitarian belief about Jesus and the Messiah, that completely separated them permanently from the Jewish faith. Mm -hmm. um, whereas before, there were Jewish people still for three centuries before Nicaea, there were Jewish communities who accepted Christ as the Messiah exactly as they always had believed the Messiah was going to come. But that was canceled. No more believing like that. Mm. Um, so when you ask a pastor or a priest or a scholar at the seminary, they're going to tell you, well, it's like water because you know, like water is like gas and ice and then it's liquid. And so it's like it's all water, but it can be in three ways. And Oh, that's like the egg, and so it's like a shell, and the yolk, and then the, yeah. yeah. So, but still, all of that is just philosophical play, and you can philosophize that the other round, because, you know, in the Bible, there's a story that John the Baptist was baptizing Jesus. Mm -hmm. For me, as a Christian, before I knew anything about Islam, this was always a problem to me. If Jesus is God, why does he need some guy who's not God to baptize him? Right. Mm. Why would I if I'm God, why would I need some prophet to cleanse me of my original sin when supposedly me and my mother were born sinless? Yeah. And so that whole thing never added up. But in that story, it's very vivid in that John the Baptist is in the river. I think it's the Jordan River where Jesus is, comes to meet him and then he baptizes him, pouring the water over him. Yes. And then from heaven. A sound, a heavenly voice says, this is my son mm -hmm. whom I am pleased. And then in the sky, the dove, Lance. they said the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. So this is in one circumstance. At the same time, you have Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and they're in different places. Mm -hmm. And they're three separate entities. And uh, you cannot, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's some weird way of trying to make that monotheism at that point because... For me, for it to make sense, God will either be present, which is the pantheonistic Hindu doctrine, yeah. mm -hmm. is that when we focus on this aspect of God, mm -hmm. then he manifests as this. And then when we look into that aspect of his qualities and what he does, then he may come as that. So here it's now it's looking like three different entities. Gotcha. In the Bible, in the entire Bible, to my knowledge, there is no word in the Bible that says Trinity. Not not just the word Trinity is not there. I mean, that that argument can be turned around on Muslims. Is the word Tawheed found in the Quran? It is not. The word Tawheed is not uh, found there. But the the de definition of it mm -hmm. uh, in the Bible, uh, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, it's well documented and admitted, I think, in Matthew somewhere, that Protestant and all the New International Version versions of the Bible, they admit that there was a verse that was added by the Catholic Church mm -hmm. um, and standardized in mainstream King James and all those Bibles that they took out because they felt that they were just trying to prove Trinity, mm. but it was not from the original manuscripts. Yeah. So there really is no one. There are references to separately Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but as one creed, as one thing, it's not, it's not there. And so as a creed, um, so that's... That's a problem, yeah. Whereas the Quran, I, you can't go up one page without God saying there is only one God. God is one. There is no deity other than him. So that is the creed of that's Islam. Right. So that's, that's right. every page of the Quran almost you have that. Yeah. I think this verse is the first John chapter 5 verse 7 that says, For there are three that bear record in the heaven, the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. Yeah, yeah. This one. First John chapter 5 verse 7. Excellent. Well, yeah. got his research so, on uh, n next question I, I want to ask you is we know Bible the New Testament has 27 books and 
about 14 of them are written by Paul or attributed to Paul. Right. And we're told that Paul, after saying Paul comes into the picture, which is about five or six decades after Jesus Christ, about 40, 50 years after Jesus Christ. Several years after yeah, Jesus years, Christ. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm not sure exactly. So when he comes in, he, he has not met Jesus Christ and he mm -hmm. has never been a disciple like the other uh, you know followers of Jesus Christ and his books 14 books form more than 50 percent of the New Testament and it is commonly understood that Paul's version of Christianity is what is what we see today for sure uh, so can you tell us a little bit about what Paul brought into Christianity and how did Paul gain that kind of momentum and fame and strength compared to the people who really stayed and worked and you know right. ate and spent time with Jesus Christ. So I think it, I think it's important to kind of navigate the history of it as well as the doctrine. Mm -hmm. um, so when we talk about Paul um, and his being someone who was originally a persecutor, he was Saul of Tarsus. Yes. So he was a Jewish uh, opposer and he felt that this is blasphemy and what the saying that he's really the Messiah and all of this and um, the way people are talking the son of God is seems exaggerated um, in, in his understanding of Judaism but then mysteriously he falls off I guess his donkey or something yeah. like that has the vision Jesus comes and appoints him as the 13th apostle um, so if we look at the first four Canaanical of the standard Bible that Christians have, have come come up with, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So it was only supposedly Matthew and John who were actual um, disciples of Christ, whereas Luke and Mark were people who were not his 12 disciples, but they were supposedly there. Interestingly enough, the earliest manuscripts of John is like close to 100 years after Jesus. Mm -hmm. So why we don't have something from there then, of those four, they're all in Greek. None of them are in Aramaic, which would have been the language of all of these people. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're missing something. Some big stuff is missing here. Um, but they would say, well, you know, they would interpret, well, you know, Greek authority and, and rulership was there. Um, but it would be very strange uh, to standardize uh, the religion of Islam in Persian, for example, which was a dominant yeah. kingdom that some Muslims would have known from trading and so forth or Assyrian or whatever. So Jews are very identity-based historically. They're ethnically religious. Mm -hmm. So Hebrew and Aramaic are very Semitic languages, very different from the Latin Greek thing. So that's one issue. Um, the second issue is um, that, why, so why is there only four or five, you know, because Acts is, has some things from the apostles as well, which comes after those four. Mm -hmm. But why is the majority of you know, two thirds of the of the New Testament, the teaching of Christianity yes. uh, as a doctrine coming from Paul. It's because Paul in his, he ventured and traveled north from uh, Palestine, where he would have been in Nazareth and Bethlehem and Jerusalem and that area. So he traveled up towards the Lebanon, Turkey, and then on into uh, you know the Greek area yeah. and all of that. So he was sending all these letters, and then you know to the Romans, and they have all mm -hmm. these letters, Corinthians, and all these letters to these groups. He's giving letters to people who have no idea anything about really. They don't even know too much about Judaism, mm -hmm. but he's telling this amazing story about Christ and Jesus, uh, and he emphasizes one point that. Um, you know, it seems like he's emphasizing this kind of separate identity, that this is some new religion rather than the finality or completion of Judaism. He's, he's even though he didn't use the term Christianity, it was given to him in Antioch by some pagan Turkish yeah. people. Mm -hmm. They called them, he keeps talking about Christ, Christ, we're from Christ, we follow Christ. He emphasizes Christ more than God and the historical mm -hmm. uh, Israelite tradition. So... Basically, when I think Constantine's son, second Constantine or third, when he became a, a believer in these letters of Paul and those who were following it, um, some centuries, you know, two and a half centuries, something like that after Jesus, then Paul's message in that powerful empire of the world resonated. 
there is well known historically all kinds of what they call Gnostic or apocryphal gospels. Some of them attributed to other companions of Jesus, even Mary, mm-hmm. you know, Thomas and others, his own brother, that they have these historical gospels. But what happened was when Nicaea established this Trinitarian thing, that was all kind of built upon and through the ideas of Paul that had become prevalent. Oh, that's their only access. Mm. They do not have access to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Yeah. So what they would find, they would come to pick Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John as the core things of his life because they fit into, they're able to fit their theology like Tertullian and his Trinitarian and mm. what they have developed in their ideas about Christ. They were able to fit all that together. And so they burned and destroyed um, any gospels, uh, or stories of Christ and his teachings that would somehow conflict with that. And so that's basically um, how his doctrine became uh, supreme. And, and unfortunately, there was a lot of bloodshed to uh, you know, establish that as a, as a final understanding of Christianity. And a lot of modern Christians aren't aware of this. And so they just think that whatever Jesus taught is just one thing, and it was always one thing, and it's very clear and known by everyone, and that's what we follow, and that's why we follow it. It's very important for all of us because even as Muslims, there is historical battles and issues about law and understanding of politics and religion that happen in our history. Um, So we shouldn't just go along with something we heard people say without really contextualizing the history as it relates to certain doctrines and laws and uh, uh, systems of, of, of theology. Okay, so what you're saying is Paul's uh, version of Christianity got a boost when Roman Emperor took it up and then from there on it spread into the uh, a good part of the world good uh, portion it was of the through world. their empire and the wars that they had is why Christianity is so prevalent gotcha 